Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for staying with us. Welcome to the last talk of the Sunrise Festival, and it's going to be a corker. We have this year's crop circles introduced and uh, explained, talked about by Richard Cratemore, who is also going to give us a history of crop circles. It's my great pleasure to introduce him. I, I heard last year's talk at the Out of the Ordinary Festival, and I thought it was incredibly entertaining and informative. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Richard Cratemore. Thank you very much. OK, um, let's start just by looking at this year's crop circles, I think, and see what we've had so far. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the geometry of them, but um, any ge expert geometers in the audience are very welcome to chime in with anything that strikes them about any of these formations. Um, we start with Inage and Chepstow. Um, 22nd of April this year. You can see there's quite a pretty pattern, the first one to arrive. Has that worked? Yeah. Nice, simple, old-fashioned, squaring the circle kind of geometry going on. Here's a slide from Bert Jansen looking at how squaring the circle is represented to 99.6% perfection in this particular formation. Um, we'll get on to a conversation in a little while about who's making them. Let's just start by looking at what we've had this year so far. Um, this is Jay Goldner's take on this particular formation, comparing the overhead photograph in the field with the perfect geometry. Um, Jay describes it as an awful fake. Um, I have to say, I'll say at this point, my personal take on crop circles has of course evolved over the years. It's so hard to discern the truth of things with the great history of MI5 disinformation and human hoaxes. Um, but there are, as far as I'm concerned, there are still a few real ones appearing. I don't think there have been hardly any in England since 2006 that are, are purely magical crop circles, we might say. But that isn't to demean the work of the gorilla geomancers who are making the human ones, either. Um, a simple little formation. At the White Horse, Alton Barnes, on the 27th of April. This is in Rape, Rape Seed. And then this one appeared near Silbury, 29th of April. Um, I'd like to, at this point, just thank the Crop Circle Connector website, where um, most of these images have come from, apart from Steve Alexander's website, Temporary Temples, is where some others have come from. Um, there's been lunar interpretations as the symbolism of this one. Nice, simple hexagonal geometry. And again, this is Jay Goldner of Studio Phoenix, the Austrian researcher, his take on it, um, how marred it is from geometric perfection. So Jay again describes this as, an, I think on an awful fake is a bit unfair. It's a pretty nice crop circle. Um, as long as you don't mind accepting <laughs> that some of them are man-made. Um, Hannington, near Cricklade, on the 7th of May, this one appeared. And again, the field reports, as I've seen them in Crop Circle Connector, haven't been out in the fields this year myself yet. The field reports suggest that um, they're fairly badly hoaxed. Lots of evidence of crush but uh, you always need to visit a, a circle very, very fresh to get a, a real how real it might be. 
um, or perhaps magical is a better word than real, supernatural of supernatural explanation, perhaps is the word. Um, having said that, this is a photograph of a really nice elongated node, which is what you'd hope to see in a, in a real circle. I don't think that human physicists have been able to replicate yet. I know they've been working on it, playing with microwaves, trying to exactly replicate the classic style of bent crop node. Um, so, for all we know, this might be one of the one of the real ones. <laughs> okay. Another one um, in the field next door, at Hannington at Cricklade. Simple circle found etched in the field. And here's one at Pitt near Winchester. Again, simple round circle. Um, for my money, the simple round circles, if any of them are of supernatural explanation in England um, these latter few years, and it's probably the very simple ones. But having said that, I'm impressed when I see a, a blown node photograph or an elongated node. East Kennett, this one appeared, 17th of May. Quite nice layering in it. Uh, again at Pitt, near Winchester. This is the best overhead that I've found of it so far. Obviously we're very early in the season. There's not a lot very exciting that's happened in England. Although there is some stuff that's happened around the rest of the world that I'll get onto in a moment. Um, bird are up down. This one appeared, which looks like this in close up. So again, fairly simple triplicities and sextuplet formation so far in England. Um, and here, just near the sanctuary, we had this series of circles laid out. Um, I've seen some slightly convincing astronomical explanations of conjunctions that are, are due up in the next couple of weeks to explain this, or one explanation that this was the planetary alignments that night. Um, not quite true, but fairly close. This is the bird drop down in more detail again. Oh, sorry, the sanctuary. Um, this is Red Collie's take on the astronomy it's representing. Um, Red Collie being uh, an Australian researcher called Horace Drew. Um. So can you all read that? Shall I read it out for you? What the words say? Um, Sanctuary of May the 28th, 2011 shows in its lower part a rare alignment of four bright planets and the moon at sunrise on May the 30th, 2011. And then the upper part shows the current path through Earth's sky of Comet, Comet McNaught. Okay, so that's a maybe. <laughs> Hackpen Hill, this one appeared on the 30th of May. Here it is again. And here it is again. Um. So, um, obviously, researching crop circles, the probably the most important thing still is to try and to discern 
how much of these are of genuine supernatural origin and therefore worth some intense study because we might learn something new either if we're a physicist or an engineer or a geomancer or a healer or a geometer um, sometimes there are, are new things to be learned from studying the, the genuinely supernatural article um, I suspect this is humans playing there certainly seems to be acknowledged now that there are a number of different teams working the Avebury area and it was certainly significant that last year um, the word went out that the police were going to get very heavy in the Avebury area on trying to catch crop circle makers and so most of the early formations appeared uh, further afield around southern England <laughs> than um, in the usual Avebury, Alton Barnes area. Having said that, um, when I'm doing my research, which is largely internet based, apart from um, odd forays into circles in summertime, the things that impress me most over the years or nowadays are either photographs of real bent nodes or associated UFO sightings over that same field, over the same night. And we've had a series of formations in Indonesia earlier on this year that uh, have the hallmarks of real ones. This one here appeared on the 23rd of January this year in uh, Yogyakarta in Java. So again, my first instinct, having turned slightly more cynical than I used to be, was that, well, Yogyakarta's a big university town, lots of students there. Perhaps they're having a go. Um, I then saw some UFO footage on YouTube over the same area, over the same week. So I began to think, hmm. And certainly there does seem to be a sense that there's more interesting stuff going on around the rest of the world in the last few years um, in terms of stuff that seems to be a bit palpably more of the supernatural persuasion. Um, you see the design there. Again, um, threefold, sixfold geometries within it. Here's another one near Yogyakarta. Wanujoyu. Wanu near Yogyakarta and another one Tegel Raya again in Java and this has got six spikes coming off it and other you see the little picture other circles near it um, the Indonesian authorities um, had a go at saying it's student pranks, but they've um, been quieter more recently. And this is the fourth of the Javanese ones at uh, Sikarang. Fourth of May, this appeared. Um, okay, what else have we had? There's probably someone in this room more equipped to pronounce this Mexican name properly than me. Do you want to have a go here? <laughs> Tlapaloya. Tlapanaloya. In Mexico. Again, um, associated UFO sightings with this one. Um, it's an interesting fact that all the UFO flying saucer sightings, crop circle stuff that's going, as it's reported in Britain, in America, in Germany, in France, in Australia, in the United States, it's um, Project Blue Book hangover of disinformation and ridicule still seems to be going on. In Mexico, it's a different state of affairs. Jaime Mousen has got a three-hour Sunday evening primetime telly program uh, where viewers from all over the world have sent in their UFO footage and it's all up there on mainstream TV. Um, check out um, Jaime Mousen's product on YouTube. It's under the title Third Millennium. All sorts of interesting footages of aliens 
one extraordinary one I saw a couple of years ago of two Mexican teenage boys playing football in a street and suddenly this character that looks like a rather tall grey appears out of a wall, they're being videoed at the time, and appears out of the wall, tries to grab one of them. The guy resists like mad and eventually manages to break three and run off, but ho both he and his mate were treated for heavy radiation sickness and um, mega, mega Geiger counter readings at that spot where the alien appeared um, through the wall. Yeah, the, Jaime's got some very interesting work on. Um, and certainly there was the big UFO sighting over Mexico City, can't remember how many years ago now, that was witnessed by tens of thousands of people. All sorts of video footage on it. Um, the word came out a year or two ago that the Pope said there's no reason not to believe in UFOs. Um, there have been grumblings that the whole Project Blue Book disinformation campaign was going to come to an end and the kind of cabal between especially the American, the British and the German governments and the Vatican to hush the whole business up um, might be showing signs of um, being dropped. Doesn't seem to have happened quite yet though. Um, there's been a few in Italy Quite hard to see very much in this photograph. This is the first one, the Perdona. And a little, uh, sorry, only the one in Italy so far, but a, a bunch in Holland. And the ones in Holland tend to be interesting because um, they're very much tied up with a particular Dutch medium, Robert Bergstra, who has previsions of where a new circle is going to form. And there's quite often, again, the UFO lights and so on. So Robert Bergstra's circles, um, Nancy Talbot, of, um, the American researcher, has been spending a lot of time with him. And they tend to be accepted as the genuine article when they appear. I'll show you a photograph later on of an alien that materialized in Robert Bergstra's living room one night. Um, OK, so a few pretty patterns, relatively simple, in Holland that have last year, um, last month or so. Sorry, this thing's gone a bit nuts suddenly. <laughs> What's happening? Uh. Um... Sorry about this. Let's see if I can get this back to work again. Okay, here we go. The Dutch ones this year. All of them in April. So you can see very simple, these are grass circles. Now I'm getting a bit more complex. I haven't seen anyone try to generate meaning out of these particular formations in terms of symbolism or geometries. Um, there's obviously something complex going on. Okay, and that's the most recent one I've collected from the 23rd of March. Um, and the other one that we've had this year so far, most of the American ones of any complexity tend to be put down to man-made, but um, you never know these days. This is Madisonville, Tennessee.
that's what we've had so far this year. Um, the English ones have just appeared in Rapeseed so far. Who knows what's going to happen this year given the state of the crop, given the drought that we're having. It's possible that some of the um, human teams are going to be more sensitive to the farmers this year and there'll be fewer ones happening in England. Um, that remains to be seen, but um, keep an eye on the Crop Circle Connector website or if you sign on to Steve Alexander's Temporary Temples website, they'll send you an email every few days with the latest formations. Um, Turn this one right off. Yeah, that one. Thanks. Okay, we're going to go back to the beginning now. Any questions? <laughs> Any questions so far? We're going to go back to the beginning of time now, have a little look at the history of crop circles. From here, dot. we'll just wait for this to load. It's quite a large file. Um, and I'm, I'm going to zap you with quite a lot of pictures of crop circles quite quickly because this is a huge folder. Yeah? Why don't we use the telltale signs of seeing a crop circle and just discerning whether it's a man made or not? Okay, the question is what are the usual telltale signs? Um, I've got a whole section of slideshows coming up later on to answer that one with. Uh, it's probably the easiest. There's a whole bunch of different telltale signs. Um, Probably the best is once you've known a real one and once you've known a human, it's relatively easy to discern, especially if the real one is within a week old. But there's a whole bunch of specific clues that will come up to the science of it a bit later. Okay, a quick whiz. Um, I've started with a, a chocolate box photograph. This is Lucy Pringle's photo. It's a bit chocolate box. It's very much part of, without wishing to be, appear cynical, a part of the Wiltshire tourist industry this, these days, <laughs> the whole crop circle phenomenon. Um, okay, thanks to these guys, you can't read them. A whole bunch of different national websites where you can find up to date stuff and research and so on. And a few relatively uninteresting photographs of actually being in the field. This was one that had a slightly Aztec styling, it was claimed, um, that I was in a couple of years ago. And this was a nice example, a very well thought out, beautifully designed crop circle that had the energy of the lovely geometry to be felt, especially standing in the center. But it didn't have the whiz that we associate with the old crop circles. Um, but they might just just imagine you're in a Wiltshire field on a sunny day, exploring the kind of beautiful detail. Um, something some of you might not have noticed, but certainly something I've noticed over the years, is that where there's a flow of the lay in the crop, if you walk around the crop circle against the flow, it's really tiring. If you walk around with the flow, it's energizing. Um, we've got some nice weaving going on here. All sorts of different pretty um, centers to circles. Okay, here's another one from a couple of years ago. Up near Temple Farm. This was a very nice play of three yin yangs. A classic um, 
the center of a formation, which usually aren't in the geometrical center. They're usually um, off center from the real geometrical center. Um, okay, let's go to the beginning. The earliest recorded representation of a crop circle is from the Prince Re Regent River Valley in northwest Australia. Some Aboriginal cave paintings that some people, and it seems, it seems like a nice explanation to me that what we've got going on here in this picture are some kind of tall alien sending a beam out from its eye and behind and above it some kind of flying saucer thing and then below that some kind of crop circle thing. And we've got a serpent representation of Earth energies running right through the center of the crop circle. And we've got some people leaning away from the beaming alien. And we've even got a kangaroo running away in the foreground. Um, of course, no one knows how old this um, cave painting is, this piece of Aboriginal rock art. But um, it's probably the first, possibly the first representation of a crop circle in human history. Sorry? Do they have crops? Do they have crops? Um, well, crop circles appear in any vegetation you can think of, as well as in snow. <laughs> so th there's been plenty of grass circles, plenty of scrub circles, sand circles, all sorts of different circles. Okay, the next little piece in history that might plausibly be to do with crop circles, the Bishop of Lyon was summoned to the King of France in the year 800 in order to explain the, um, the strange patterns that kept appearing in the fields surrounding Lyon. People feared the work of the devil. So this is recorded in the um, histories of France. And here we have a, a typical medieval woodcut showing possibly witches dancing around the devil. But the devil looks quite a happy man kind of figure. Um, and certainly when we get into explanations of who it is that's making the crop circles, certainly one of the active components seems to be the elemental realms. Okay, another pretty woodcut of people dancing in a circle. And another more contemporary photograph of the Ashdown Forest Morris men. Um, could, could you give me a hand on this computer a second? I can't get these slides up on the on the big viewer, so I can't actually read this one. This is the Ashdown Forest Morris men, who are up at dawn on Beltane morning to dance at Jill's lap or the enchanted place on the very top of Ashdown Forest. And there's something I'd like to read you on the bottom of this slide. I can't get that up to there. Maybe if you could just double click it. If I double click, click it. Ah, OK, moving it. <laughs> Let's put it in this. Uh, one second. Um, I'll paraphrase anyway. Um, Henry VIII sent his surveyor, John Leland, around Britain. Um, and Leland was particularly interested in recording folk customs. And he asked a group of Morris dancers where it was that they got the inspiration for their complicated dance steps. And the reply surprised him. The reply was, um, we um, are inspired to make our dances by the complicated 
grass formation or, or the complicated circles that are fields. So there's a suggestion that Morris dancing has evolved from crop circles. Um, and certainly, um, we'll come a little bit later to um, an interview with the Zulu Sangoma, Credo Matwa, who says something very similar in Zulu tradition, is that when circles appear in the fields, it's considered a great blessing, and we go out and fence them off so that they don't get trampled, and dance and make ceremony and give thanks and take omens. Okay, the classic woodcut and um, article from a Hertfordshire newspaper. Um, can anyone read that date? Sixteen seventy-eight. This appeared in a Hertfordshire newspaper. The strange story of someone who, or a farmer, who refused to pay the price that someone was asking to charge to mow the mow his meadow and then he came back the next day to found this um, it's represented as an oval formation um, in the fields and they considered it must be the work of the devil and here is the devil um, mowing ostensibly with a sheaf uh, with a, a scythe rather the crop formation this is a bit of a classic the next time we see crop circles represented in literature in England is in Robert Plott's Natural History of Staffordshire in 1686. Um, he explored, and you can see three examples of the diagrams that he drew in his book here. And interestingly, he prefigures a lot of the research into cymatics and the possibility of sound forming crop, um, forming crop circles with his picture of a trumpet coming out of a cloud. Um, you can see a couple of trumpets. One of them, the, bo the lower one, is blowing a kind of square image as well as a circular image. Um, so they were certainly happening in Staffordshire in 1686. Crop formations were well known about then. Um, the Zulu Sangoma Credo Matu. Um, let me just read this. In the foreword of the book Isilwani, The Animal Tales and Fables of Africa, published 1996. Mutwa recounts the following. At harvest time we left some of our corn standing so that passing birds could share in the bounty of our fields and by sharing bless us and ensure us of plenty of food. Sometimes large fields of corn and millet were planted. These were sacred to the goddess and were offered to the vast armies of birds to eat. This is him talking about his Zulu shaman tradition. Uh, no human being could enter the sacred cornfield. The sacred fields were ploughed far from the ordinary millet, maize and corn as they were left unfenced. Over centuries people had discovered that the star gods sometimes communicated with human beings through these sacred fields. Time and again strange circular depressions were seen in the centre of these fields. These depressions were called Izishozi Zamatonga the great circle designs or writings of the gods. These circles were an amazing sight to see. The gods never cut the stalks of corn or millet when they formed these depressions. It appears as though a great circular disc-shaped force has descended on the field. It pressed the corn firmly into the ground without breaking the stalks or damaging the plants. Then the force appears to spin, resulting in the strange spiral appearance of the fallen stalks. Words cannot describe such a phenomenon which I have seen more than 30 times in the course of my life as a traditional healer. Whenever a circle appeared in the fields, the people rushed to erect offensive poles around the circle. They would dance and perform other sacred rituals honoring the star gods and the earth mother. All the kings and chiefs awaited the arrival of these circles. The appearance would be cause for celebrations that lasted several days. These celebrations were accompanied by prayers to the gods to watch over the people and to talk to them through the sacred circles. We have known about them for more than 4,000 years. 
If the land is too flat, you cannot see what the gods have been telling us unless you go to a nearby mountain to have a good vantage point from which to view the design. They don't destroy the plants, they bend them so that after a time the plant can recover. They don't want to destroy. This is why those men who say that these are all forgeries are wrong. How can somebody fake something like this? Um, without damaging the plants. You can't. It also takes those who try it many, many hours to do so. This is not the way the gods make it, he shows you. These things, they happen to pass important messages to the people through the crops. The Ishizoshi happen to appear many times when our people are planting the African crop that they call mabili, or sorghum in English. The gods used to flatten the plants not to break them, so that after a time when the people have read the message, the plants would stand up again and grow. I've always wanted to have a farm of my own to watch out for the writings of the gods, because this is intelligence, very, very big. And whatever these powerful beings are telling us even means that our minds are too stupid. To understand, our modern minds have been corrupted by Western civilization. That is, refusing to believe that things like the crop circles could be real and important. This is why we do not understand the simple messages anymore. The crop circles also tell us about the situation of the sun. But why, you may ask, is the earth mind telling us about the sun? The crop circle phenomenon talks of a time of great activity of the sun. But why? Why does this great intelligence, this mother spirit, why does it tell us about this thing? When there is trouble in the sun, then what happens to the human beings down here? When there is trouble in the sun, there will be also trouble down on earth. And this is why the crop circles are appearing. They even tell us things that will happen in the future. They can also be warnings. For example, sorry about this. If there is going to be a war, the crop circles tell us. In the old days, when the gods put crop circles in our fields, the people used to run quickly to take sticks and stones all around the design to mark it out. We wanted that the gods should say again what they are telling us. This is therefore so that the crop circle does not die and that the gods will then respond again with another crop circle nearby. This is why sometimes there will be a new crop circle after an old one. This is how the African stone circle monuments came into existence. And this happened all over the world wide, as with Stonehenge, Avebury and the like. The Stonehenge monument you can see today, there used to be a crop circle there. This would have been regarded as a very holy thing. So the ancient people... Um, sorry, so the ancient people marked it with earth, stones, and wooden sticks. They're sort of saying thank you to the intelligence that is behind. They were not built just for decoration. The ancient chiefs, kings, and holy people were not fools. They were in tune with the great spirits of the earth. They were in tune with the mysteries of the world. They knew more that we give them credit for, but they kept the knowledge away from us. Deciphering it is in their temples, therefore you can see so many similarities between the crop circles and ancient sacred art. This is no coincidence. Here, and this is Andreas Muller's interview with Credo Matra, pointing to a so-called grape shot circle, which is a little circle to the side of the main formation. Uh, the gods have given us a sign. This is where they have signed off like a signature. They are saying, here is the message over and out. We have to acknowledge the design from here. This is where we have to respond. They mark the spot from where to view these grape shot circles. <laughs> Interpret the designs as well as the spot to respond to the intelligence behind. We have to measure the new formations from one to the other side. The bigger the formations, the more important the message and the closer the date. This is one of the holy things. It is teaching us about the human mind. It also teaches us about the world mind. We say the earth has got a brain and the brain passes knowledge to the people through the sacred fields. 
These crop circles are created by a power which is compassionate. The spirit who marks the crop circles guides human beings. It tells them important things that human beings are not aware of yet. A long time ago, when all my sacred items were given to me, I was told that we must always look out for those things. Always, because this is what the God... This is what the God Spirit, which is the mind of the Earth, is telling us about important things about the universe, about what is going to happen. These are things that we Sangomas are called to investigate, to watch out for the writings of the gods. The signs do prophesy; they tell us about the future. This is why Sangomas must plant millet, because this is the plant the gods prefer to speak through. I remember that my grandmother used to say that we must show respect for the crop circles, as well as we have to show our respect to the standing stones. We want it that the gods should say again what they're telling us. This is therefore so that the crop circle does not die and that the gods will then again respond with another crop circle nearby. This is why sometimes there'll be a new crop circle next to the old one. Oh, hang on. I just doubled my page. Okay, um, if there's going to be a war, the crop circles tell us. And this is what this diagram up on the screen is about. Um, these things are warnings. Our crop circles in Africa are not only circles. They're just as complicated as the English ones, even more complex sometimes. Our biggest crop circle appeared in Zululand. It was made up of four of them inside a big square. And in the center was a picture, a picture of a gun, a picture of a gun cannon. That was just before the terrible Battle of Alundi in 1879, where the English used artillery pieces and Gatling guns, which was the first highly successful rapid repeating firearms on the Zulus for the very first time. So Credit Mutt was saying just before the Battle of Alundi, this crop circle appeared representing a Gatling gun in the middle. And then a little later, the English artillery used it on the Zulus. Um, Andreas Muller noted after this interview back in Germany, back home in Germany, I was checking out the available sources for information on the Battle of Alundi. Whilst reading through the various documents, I stumbled upon a detail that had not even been mentioned by Credo Matwa. Apparently, the British troops, consisting of some 17,000 men, marched to the battle in the form of a hollow square and halted on a low hill about three kilometers west of Ondini. So the crop circle formation appeared to not only predict the weapon used, but also the way the British troops were fighting on the top of the hill, firing Gatling guns from inside their protective hollow square of soldiers. Um, okay, I found that article, or that um, interview with Credo Matwa really fascinating to get a traditional, highly respected, is, kind of the grandfather of Sangomas in Southern Africa these days. And that was his oral tradition on crop circles. Mm -hmm. I got stuck. Yeah, yeah, that worked. Right, thanks. There we go. Um, Nature, respected scientific magazine, 1880. There was records of crop circles near Guildford. Um, the storms about this part of Surrey have been lately local and violent, and the effects... Um, I can't quite read it. <laughs> Sorry? Produce. Produce, thank you. Uh, I've got a very small screen here to read it on. Um, uh, yeah. 
Do you, you want me to read it up? <laughs> no, you're right. Well, I've made the point anyway. Journal Nature from 1880. Okay, the, we're now coming into the contemporary era nearly. And this was a big famous um, flying saucer landing spot at Tully in northern Queensland in 1966. Um, so this time there's a whole bunch of UFO sightings and this particular grass circle was the biggest of them. Um, one of the recurring features in the Tully crop circles was there were actually three depressions in the ground as if legs had come out of some kind of flying saucer that had landed there. And that's a bit of a recurring theme, you find that occasionally. So I, I think one can make a distinction between a, a simple grass circle that might actually be the landing spot of some kind of UFO and the other more complex geometrical formations. Round about this time that um, there was a big flying saucer flap in Tully in Queensland, um, in 66, there was also stuff happening in Warminster, big UFO flap in the late 60s. Um, okay, the next picture I've got is uh, quite an early one from 1981, the Devil's Punch Bowl, just near Cheesefoot Head, um, east of Winchester. That was where the crop circles really started coming back in England for this latest round we've had. So, um, and this particular one here, three circles in a row, was the first time in English formations recently that there was something more than a simple circle. And having three circles in a dead straight line suggested that um, some of the scientists' pet theories of wind vortexes had to be thrown out of the window. There was actually some conscious design going on. Okay, on through a series of formations in, um, here's one at Headbourne Worthy in Winchester in 1982. Cheesefoot Head, 1990. And this was the first of the circle and cross formations to appear. They then came thick and fast in the early 80s. Um, this one was photographed by Dennis Healy from his property near Alfriston, near the Long Manor Wilmington in East Sussex. Um, Andover, long stock, nice big circle and cross. Uh, Paddy Field in northern Japan, a rice circle in 1986. Cheesefoot Head, starting to get a little more complex now. Cheesefoot Head in Hampshire from about 1986. Going on up, things are going to get more complicated. Um, this is another circuit, um, set of three in Beckhampton. And all sorts of stuff coming on. Westbury, Bratton, Winterbourne Stoke near Stonehenge. Um, now this was, there's some weirdnesses that come with crop circles. And this is one of the classic weirdnesses. Um, here's a story from Colin Andrews. More than a little mystery surrounded this discovery. This spot formed a straight line with a set of five circles off the main runway off the top secret air establishment at Boscombe Down to the east. Exactly two months later after this formation arrived on the 22nd of October, a top secret jet aircraft, the Harrier Jump Jet, was flying on a test mission on a flight path exactly coinciding with the line which connected the two crop formations and flying directly over both. Between the two, just seconds apart at the flight speed of the jet, communications was lost with the pilot. A full air, sea and ground search was put into force by the flight control centre at the secret base. An American transport aircraft flying off the south coast of Wales to the southwest of Winterbourne Stoke spotted the Harrier and came in to shadow it. The crew of the American plane reported that the ejector seat was still in the craft, but the pilot was missing. The crew videotaped the aircraft. Um, the Harrier remained on a straight path and eventually crashed into the Atlantic when it ran out of fuel. <coughs> <coughs> Two days later, the body of the pilot was found near the crop circle. 
Obviously, his ejector seat was still in the plane. Um, Andrews was interviewed by the Ministry of Defence crash investigators and asked many questions about the crop circles and any strange effects or readings measured by researchers. Certainly one recurring theme is aircraft losing their electrics when flying directly over crop circles. Okay, um, <coughs> cheese for a head. Uh, just while I think about it, um, it's not just planes that lose their electrics. There have been a number of reports of flights of geese flying over a crop circle. And instead of flying directly over, they've been seen to split into two halves to miss the, if you imagine, a tube going up from the crop circle into the atmosphere. The birds will split, fly round the formation and then join up again. They know not to fly in. This particular formation at Cheesefoot Head in 1988, this was where a flight of about three and a half thousand racing pigeons disappeared when flying over this formation or flying in the area of this formation on their, on their way home from a, a race from France to England. The pigeons just disappeared. Never found. Um, this was a true equilateral triangle that appeared for Hampton and Hampshire in 88. Three single circles placed in a perfect equilateral triangle, making it the first crop formation to exhibit a musical diatonic ratio. Furthermore, its physical features were extraordinary. Um, a series of circles that had been previously flattened, now the stems were lifting back to the light of the sun in a selective manner. In the first circle, plants were bending on the node nearest to the ground. In the second circle, plants were lifting up on the node halfway up the stem. And in the third group, they were bending at the node nearest the head. They'd grown into a pattern consisting of seven concentric rings and 48 spokes. Um, will you excuse me for a couple of minutes to talk amongst yourselves? I just need a quick bladder break.
Okay, sorry about that. Um, now, it occurs to me that I'd better go a bit quickly, because if I take the long form of the slideshow, we'll be here for about another three hours. So I'm going to try and whiz through fast. Um, where were we there? There. Silbury Hill. Um, this was quite exciting. This was a big moment that we had three of these um, cruciform crop circle formations appearing over the course of a week, right close to Silbury Hill. And there is this recurring relationship between our old, especially Neolithic sites, to some extent Bronze Age, but especially Neolithic sites, with um, where the crop circles are, are landing. And certainly when we are tuning in to the source of the true formations, where they've come from, by and large, the channeled information available suggests that it's actually a collective of compassionate, benign beings looking out for the future of humanity and the future of the Earth that includes our own human ancestor spirits, the relationship with Neolithic barrows, and of course the elemental realms, and of course some kind of extraterrestrial or intraterrestrial consciousness as well. Um, generally speaking, as far as the benign aliens are concerned, it's the Pleiadians and the um, Syrians and the... What's the third one now? Pleiadians, Syrians, um, the other one will come back to me. The three different groups of aliens who are reckoned to be part of a kind of general collective who the ancient Egyptians called the Netaru, a collective of different benign spirits watching out for us. Arcturians, thank you, yes. Um, this particular formation here, this is um, bizarre little details that you find researching crop circles. I'll tell you this story. Magnetic anomalies were detected and numerous banded clusters of plants within the areas surrounding satellite circles were laying flattened to the ground. The clusters were also laying and spiraled in sympathy with the closest satellite to each band. A report came from the house owner overlooking the Cherhill field later that year in winter. A narrow column of ice had grown out of the centre of her bird bath. The stone bath was shaped exactly as a Celtic cross, and from the centre rose the long shaft of ice. Ice forms and grows faster in strong electric fields. It was this site where magnetic filings were discovered in a circle during 93. This was also the same site where Roy Lucas witnessed several spinning inverted columns of mist on the same day as circles formed on the farm. Okay, uh, back in Hampshire at Longwood Warren. And this, this rather stunning one at Langton Herring with lots and lots of 22 grape shots around that circle. Um, Winterbourne Stoke. And this one here at Winterbourne Stoke in 89 was the first formation to go beyond the simple swirl into, you can see here, four um, very clear different directions of lays. Um, round about 89, these are circles from Victoria in Australia. And in 90, Filey Mount, an old Bronze Age barrow, picking up this theme of formations appearing very close to Neolithic or Bronze Age sites. Chilcombe Farm at Cheesefoot Head in Hampshire in 90. We, um, formations started to evolve into this um, glyph series. First of all, this one. This one, they're starting to get more complex. 1990, this was happening. And all around the world in 1990, 91, 92, the formation started getting more complex. To this one, here's just a little look at the geometry of that one. <coughs> and then we started getting longer ones. Uh, Eastfield Alton Barnes in 1990. Um, this was the first crop circle I ever went in. Um, in the days when crop circles really gave you a good zapping, maybe gave you a bit of a, a physical catharsis 
a bit of a, a, a mega clean-up. Um, crop circles are very much associated, especially the real ones, with healing. Occasionally there's um, one where people get migraines and people don't like. But there's, um, for example, still a folk tradition in Hungary that if a crop circle appears in the fields, you take your sick kids into the crop circle as soon as you possibly can because you know they'll get mended if, they, if you can reach the energy of a, a real crop circle. Um, this was stunning. And it struck me, as I remember at the time, that it seemed to be some kind of seven chakra progression. And I thought, am I imposing some kind of model to fit? And I had a look at it and went through the different formations. And in the one that represented the base chakra, which is the entrance, there was kind of rubbish left and empty tins of beer and things. Um, up in the heart chakra is where people started communicating or smiling at each other but it was in the throat chakra circle, which is where the animated conversations were going on about what, what, what they could possibly mean. Um, a superb little circle right at the very top, corresponding to eighth chakra, that for me was the place to view the whole formation for this one. Um, and then a whole series of more linear ones. All in the Avebury area. East Kennet, this one. And there's another one uh, in Rice Paddy in Japan, 1990 we're in. Here was one at Stonehenge that came down in 91. And these two came at um, Alton Priors and um, read it somewhere close to the Avery. anyway. Um, this was an interesting pair, a pair of um, physicists, Myers and Percy, um, had a look at the details of the differences between these two nearly um, identical formations. And they discovered that the differences encoded three different speeds of light. Time to a large degree is governed by gravity and its ability to slow down the speeds of light. The ability to transubstantiate matter would require, among other things, an understanding of the illusion of time, the function of gravity, knowledge of the proposed three speeds of light, and the spinning vortex action of molecules. That's from um, Two Thirds of History of Our Galaxy by David Myers and David Percy, published in 99. So this is one of the examples of crop formations that have really inspired astronomers, physicists, geometers to um, make breakthroughs. These three um, whale formations, they're called, scattered around the Wiltshire countryside, Beckhampton, Lockeridge, and um, near Hungerford. These are actually in a perfect equilateral triangle in relation to each other where they were sighted in the Wiltshire landscape. So we can start to look at wider patterns of how the crop circles connect up to each other in any particular year. This one here was very exciting. This was so exciting that the MOD cordoned off the fields for a few days after this one appeared to make sure no one could visit it. Um, and this is actually a very close representation of a medieval hermetic diagram. Um, in hermetic philosophy, it's a diagram representing cosmic law, a collection of numeric, musical, and geometrical harmonies which founded the prevailing order in every ancient civilization. It's literally a depiction of the realm of God. It embodies the principle of the three in one, the Father, the Holy Wisdom, and the Son, with the Godhead at the center. It's a representation of the cosmic egg symbol of creation, where the three elements, mercury, sulfur, and ether, are given substance by the breath of God and made into matter. This is a, a quote from Freddie Silver. The central circle contains the total area of the surrounding three circles. The sum of all the areas comes to 31,680 square feet, 3168 being the Gematrian number representing Christ. The same number was also revered by pagan religions as the number of the highest principle, the Creator. That's Freddie Silver's take on this one. That's a little look at the geometry of it.
Um, when this one appeared, it was very close to the town of, of Roughton, or Roughton, and the whole town, the electricity went down that night. <coughs> um, and country residents around the nearby Neolithic hill fort of Barbary Castle had witnessed the by now usual aerobatic display of small brightly coloured flying objects followed by what many described as a low rumbling noise akin to that heard at Alton Barnes the previous year. So this was um, an unmistakable and identifiable philosophical and alchemical symbol dealing with the very creation of the universe. The pattern is one of the most important alchemical and hermetic symbols. Features in Mikha Spacher's 1654 book, Kabbalah in Alchemia, as the diagram representing the very process of creation. Um. You want to know more about this one? I've got lots more notes on this. The three balls are said to represent the three alchemical elements, salt, sulfur and mercury, in conjunction with the godhead at the centre, which unites the three to create the universe. In other words, the three elements are spun together and held in equilibrium until an energy from the creator activates the process. This is the act of material manifestation. The diagram is also well known to Kabbalists and Rosicrucians, whose roots can be traced back to the ancient Egyptian mystery schools. Um, I think that's enough detail on that one, apart to say that um, it's also inspired engineers to create an anti-gravity machine. And I, I read recently that um, engineers in working independently in three continents now have managed to create an anti-gravity machine based on the principles that they've worked out from this diagram that actually um, manages to rise off the ground a few inches or a couple of feet. So they're getting anti-gravity working from the clues from this, um, this particular crop formation. It dates back to 92. Um, this was something very interesting that came down in Germany, uh, Grasdorf in 91. Now in the three circles that have got crescents around them were found three little metal discs of gold, silver and bronze. And the discs had the design, and they were found buried, found by a metal detector. Um, buried, I can't remember how many inches, under the soil surface. Um, but they all had the exact crop formation stamped on them as lumps of metal. And the silver was incredibly pure. Um, the gold one has disappeared quite soon into the hands of a collector. Hasn't been seen since. Um, but here's a couple of those, um, I think these are the bronze ones. Okay, so here's a little um, snippet in 91, frustrated with the, um, trying to decipher the symbolism of the formations. Um, a, a German researcher wrote with the farmer's permission in the field, talk to us. And the reply came back just over the hill a week later. Um, with this design that's had a number of different interpretations. Um, one idea is that it's an old Templar style of writing. Um, two different translations working on different schemes, both with something about um, we, we don't like acts of um, deceit and cunning. Whether that's a reference to MI5, whether it's a reference to human hoaxes. Um, not sure what. The answer was a bit unclear. Now, this was an extraordinary formation that appeared in 91 in Nickleton in Cambridgeshire. Um, Q 
curiously a letter to the New Scientist magazine a year before, on the 11th of August, said, the formations of corn circles are growing in complexity each year. How long bef before we see a complete Mandelbrot set? This formation, which appeared a year bar a day, exactly from that letter, publication of that letter, is a Mandelbrot set, um, an which is an element of chaos theory discovered by the French mathematician Benoit Mandelbrot, who had taught nearby at Cambridge. A lead article in this same edition had admitted that it was impossible to draw this diagram without a computer. So Nick Collister made the point that this was the first agroglyph that could not have been made using a rope and stake because of its ever-changing curvature. Um, Professor Mandelbrot commented after this formation that uh, he was glad to see his ideas were taking root. Um, yeah, okay. Cute cartoon. Um, and then, oh, sorry? <laughs> Increasing complexities coming up. This one is generally interpreted as some kind of chromosome image. Um, possibly representing the gaps, representing bits of our DNA that are being unused at this time in the amino acid coding. Okay, let's scamper on a bit through some of the formations of the 90s. This one, um, the night that the SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial, Terrestrial Intelligence, whose logo this is, we're having a meditation trying to contact the crop circle makers. This one appeared that same night in the fields. Here's a cute snail, which people thought had um, something to do with dodd men. And this is a very interesting mandala, very similar to Indo-Aryan um, symbols called the Great Turning in Prehistoric Europe or the Dharmic Wheel. Um, and both Buddhists and Celts have recognized the symbol, um, no doubt also Taoists, as representing the Eightfold Wheel of the Year. Um, and if you notice, one of the symbols is actually where the water trough in the field is. So the water trough is included in the design. Um, a little collection of the evolution of pictographs through 1990 to 1992. And now Red Collie did some very interesting work on trying to decipher the symbolism of these pictographs. And this is the stuff that he came up with. Um, using a particular old um, set of astrological symbols. Um, I think it was late Roman astrological symbols starting to put these formations together in terms of representing a conjunction, uh, an opposition of planets. Uh, representations of the sun on the left, representations of the moon, with the circle and cross formations representing Earth. So the moon symbols were next shown overlaid with sun symbols in order to describe solar eclipses. Ray Colley gives a list of eclipses coinciding nicely with the dates of formations appearing. Other crop circles for Venus, Mars and Jupiter appeared shortly after. Um, so suggestions were made that major conjunctions coming up were being represented in these formations. Here's a little list of the conjunctions were happening. We've got more crop circles for Mercury and Saturn. Variants. Um, other suggestions that other formations represented particular constellations. And this sum, this work astrological symbolism was published in about 90, 94, 95. And as if to prove it, as if to prove the point, this formation appeared here in 99 in East Field. Huge long formation, the longest yet. And taking apart the individual parts and deciphering them according to Red Collie's system of um, 
astrological event symbolism, conjunctions, oppositions, eclipses. It made complete perfect sense with the major planetary alignment that was happening, I can't quite read the date. It was due to happen the following year, I think. Um, so no sooner had we cracked the astrological code than um, they stopped happening, really. <laughs> and we moved on to different style. This formation here was um, near Silbury Hill. This was exactly on the Mary line. So this is to introduce another theme in the, in the crop circles the business of how often they find themselves on major Earth energy lines. Either the Mary line, the Michael line, as the underground currents, or on the straight ley lines. Uh, and, and as I said earlier, um, the recurring theme is on the crossing of the main ley line with the main underground water line in any given field. Um, I actually asked a couple who run one of the circle making teams in Wiltshire a year or so ago um, I said I've been to a couple of your formations recently and it seems to me that just like the the supernaturally explained ones they're always sighted almost always sighted on the crossing point of the major ley line with the major underground water line in any given field do you have a dowser on your team and the reply was um, no we don't have a dowser on our team um, our geometer um, is obviously inspired from somewhere when he creates a design and then when we get to the edge of the field we just throw our hands up and ask for our feet to be guided to the point in the field to mark as the center point to start creating the formation and they obviously in tune and find what a dowser would then discern as the crossing of the lay with the underground water line which is of course um, a kind of dowsing earth energy prerequisite for bothering to slice a church or a cathedral or a stone circle anyway. Okay, in 1990, by Thorne in Cambridgeshire, we had our first mandala style crop formation. Um, all the pentagonal geometry. Oops, I seem to have jumped one there. Back. Back. This was a particularly interesting formation. This was near Hungerford, uh, and there's a um, uh, there's a um, this was a, a tortoise-shaped formation that came down, and there were power lines right over it, and it seemed like some of the energy that had created the formation had transformed down the power line, or transferred down the power line, and created a messy version with a discernible sense of copy of the template of the original formation had appeared when the energy was grounded under the telegraph pole. Um, here's another example of a formation that came down either side of a power line. In this instance, something different happened. The power line split the formation in two. And again, the same sense of the pattern repeating at the base of the um, power pole nearby. So th th there is a recurring business that um, any time um, you think you're getting a handle on a pattern, on a rule, then the next formation goes and changes it. Okay, a little spin on, I won't talk too much through these. Just feast your eyes on this progression of crop formations. In Hampshire, in Sussex. These just over the hill from each other in East Sussex. This was a famous formation that made everyone sick who went in it. This was a famous formation that um, someone made up a remedy from corn from the center, or with uh, grain rather, wheat from the center of this formation, and cured their kids' retinal tumor, just using um, basically homeopathic um, crop circle corn from this formation. There's certainly been a good, all sorts of stories of um, miracle healings, 
even cancers going away, chronic rheumatisms going away and so on after people have entered crop circles. A little progression. This one here in West Kennet, the first of the so-called galaxies, the MOD paid the farmer to cut this out the day after it had appeared because it might represent too obviously decipherable um, astronomical information. But another one appeared soon after here and another one here and people were able to plot how these what these these represented planet wise um, and it seems a very clear sense of showing a conjunction of Mars Saturn and Jupiter in the constellation Cetus with a crescent moon to appear um, and, and this alignment was actually going to appear on the 6th or 7th of April 2000. Now the formation, these formations were coming down in 94. But they um, worked the Almanac, discovered that these planets were happening on 2000. The, and the three formations, West Kennet and Foxfield, depicted the same alignment w with slightly different zoom perspectives <coughs> and slightly different um, emphasis on individual elements within the charts. So this was predicting something that was going to happen six years later. On the predicted date, we had one of the largest solar storms in the century. <coughs> caused a huge solar flare as the sun reached its 11-year sunspot cycle peak. <coughs> the Earth's ionosphere was flooded with radiation, threatening satellite communications and other electronic systems. <coughs> <coughs> there was an unexpected computer crash on the English stock markets and also the aurora borealis was widely visible all across northern Europe on the night of the 6th <coughs> <coughs> So a certain sense of um, trying to gain our confidence in being able to predict astronomical events that we don't know yet. And this has been a bit of a recurring theme through the 90s too. Okay, on to 94. We're starting to get some beautiful flower mandalas coming up. This extraordinary spider's web near Avebury actually um, inspired uh, Red Collie, I think it was, to actually learn an awful lot more about the geometry and symbolism of Avebury. Um, a whole other series of counts that one could make of uh, different astronomical cycles represented within the design of Avebury. Um, you can find all the details of that on the Crop Circle Connector website in the archives, which you'd have to pay 15 quid a year to access. Well worth it if you're interested in the subject. Okay, on through 13 moons at Avebury Truslow. And on to some spiral forms. That one at Beckhampton, Bratton, Sisbury in West Sussex, East Meon in Hampshire, um, okay here's a little look at um, basic principles of sacred geometry and how they're manifesting in some of these formations now. Let's not labour them. Um, some wise words on the geometry of crop circles from John Martineau. I won't whiz into. Um, this was the moment where the astronomer Gerald Hawkins started um, getting interested um, Gerald Hawkins was famous for his investigations at Stonehenge um, and he was one of the first 
a writer's suggested an early astronomical observatory. He got interested in some of these crop circles and he actually um, devised three new Euclidean theorems, no, five new Euclidean um, theorems um, derived from Euclidean geometry. So this was great big advance in geometry, came as a result of Gerald Hawkins. Um, again, I won't labor the details of them. Onward, let's scamper on through evolving designs. Okay, this some um, notch effect is called a lambdoma, or a Pythagorean table. It defines the exact relationships between musical harmonics and mathematical ratios. So by translating sound frequencies and hertz relative to each musical interval into feet, a circular matrix containing all relative harmonic pro proportions can be constructed. The darkened segments indicating each octave match the ratchets of the Stockbridge crop circle. Um, this Bishop Sutton formation, this appeared in June 95. Um, again, this was interpreted to record the trajectory of Comet Bradfield. It came to its closest Earth approach on the 26th of July, about um, seven weeks later. Earth's astronomers actually only learned of the comet's existence after it had passed in August 95. Um, but it seemed to be a very clear representation of it. Um, the more so since it predicted exactly where it was going to outburst, which is no way our scientists could have predicted that. So more of these galaxy-style formations. This one interpreted like this to represent an upcoming conjunction. Um, this formation here shows the four inner planets of our solar system surrounded by the asteroid belt with the Earth's orbit but not planet shown. Viewed from below the plane of the ecliptic, this com confirmation corresponded with the date of formation, 26th of June 95. Viewed from above the plane of the ecliptic, this revealed the date on 16th of January 98 when the Earth would be in inferior conjunction to Venus. Um, and superimposing the Bishop Sutton chart upon this second one to scale reveals the position of the mi missing Earth. So playing around with imposing two formations on one another then yields more information. Um, this was an interesting one that appeared in Adelaide. Nice little sun-moon pair in Hampshire. Sun and Moon in 96 and then also in 96 on opposite sides of the M1 to each other in Cambridgeshire we had this one a little sprout growing out um, this was an early one this was a May formation 11th of May um, as if the sprout is emerging out of the seed and then a week later on the other side of the M1 that seed has sprouted a bit further Okay, on starting to pick up some crop circles in Oxfordshire now. They're starting to spread a bit more. This one's from Saffron Waldron and Essex. Um, that's a little piece about diatonic ratios and how they come to be represented in these formations. And then on with increasing complexity through 96. Um, this is a Sanskrit 
old Sanskrit style representing base chakra. A round way. And this one represents solar plexus chakra. And another little evolution on from the uh, sprouting seed one. Um, there is a suggestion that this represents the Mayan symbol for the center of our galaxy. And then, as Nick was talking about fractal mathematics earlier, we had this extraordinary first big um, fractal formation appeared at Stonehenge. And this was a bit of a classic, partly because this appeared at four in the afternoon, most of them appear at night. And there's eyewitness reports, both from a pilot flying over, who flew over and then back 20 minutes later, and said in that 20 minutes the formation appeared, because it definitely wasn't there when he flew over earlier. Equally, the security guards at Stonehenge didn't see anything happening. Um, and... Again, astronomical interpretation, possibly. But this new fractal series then caught on with formations like this. Again, there's an astronomical interpretation. And it appears again in this one. Um, these were two that came down together. There's a lunar interpretation there. But something particularly odd, considering those came down in 96, I think it was. In 2004, um, a deer hunter near Roswell, New Mexico, found this stone just on the ground, a strange rock, less than two inches across, weighing about 40 grams, with unusual properties, deeply scored with exactly the pattern that we'd seen in that crop circle formation from uh, August 98. Interesting. <laughs> Has anyone here seen Paul, the new movie? Um, it's by the um, same team that brought you Shaun of the Dead and um, Hot Fuzz. And it's a, a wonderful take on the whole um, UFO industry around Roswell. A couple of English um, hippie nerd dudes making their way around um, New Mexico and encountering a, a wise-cracking alien who's been held by the Americans <laughs> since Roswell. Very, very funny film. Can highly recommend it. Anyway, I digress. Okay, this was widely interpreted either as something to do with DNA or something to do with lunar calendars. Certainly we start to see more of these serpentine formations now. Uh, this was a classic UFO landing with um, associated eyewitnesses from Sao Paulo in Brazil. Statistics, distribution of formations around the Avebury area up to 96. Um, an attempt to show a relationship with water levels, uh, water tables and underground water particularly. So you asked earlier about the particular clues that make us discern, will help us discern what's a real one. So here's a little set now about those clues. Um, Weird stuff. Anomalies. In some cases, the seed heads of crop circle plants do not contain any seeds. That mainly occurs in formations formed in young crop. crop for, uh, in other words, formations where the crops are not yet ripe. To the left, we've got normal control seed heads. To the right, we've got crop circle seed heads with the seeds gone. Number two, the great classic elongated nodes, where the nodes have actually been bent like that or expulsion cavities, the blown nodes you see on the right. This is the result of brief, intense heat. Moisture in the plant is turned to energy that resembles microwave energy. As a result, the moisture expands. Um, if the plant's not yet ripe, the rising pressure can be absorbed by the flexible parts of the plant. These nodes expand and remain forever in their new state and can't stretch back to their original position. 
So there have been, a, um, or sometimes they expand and the steam explodes them. But as I say, to my, as far as I know, certainly until a couple of years ago, we hadn't been able to replicate that with our cleverest microwave scientists. Um, this was a distribution of, this is some work of a, a Dutch scientist whose name escapes me now, looking at the distribution of nodes from center to periphery of a circle. And from this he deduced that the energy pulse must come from about 30 meters above the circle. Um, twisted plants, this is a recurring theme. Occasionally you'll find plants that are torn off, heads torn off. You'll quite often find plants that have been bundled together, spun together. We get the little corn dollies in the center that can be all sorts of different shapes and styles. We find that plants other than the main crop are left standing when the crop is downed, as if there's that precise selectivity that you can down the wheat or the barley, but you'll leave weeds alone. Um, anomalous germination and growth patterns. You see, um, this was um, an example which tends to stuff them where the crop circle appeared early in the crop season. Um, some, sometimes the crops or the seeds from the crop formations grow extraordinarily well the following year. Um, they're like super, super seeds, so following on from um, some of the research he's done on taking seed to sacred site in order to um, enhance its fertility. A crop formation can potentially do the same thing. Um, of heat, sometimes scorch marks are found. Here's a formation where a whole bunch of flies were found, some of them still alive, with their tongues stuck to the corn, to the crop. So they must have been in the act of um, eating the crop when the formation appeared. So generally speaking, animals, mammals, get out of the way when a formation's happening. And it seems these flies didn't. Ghosts in the fields, you can see the following year. Um, and again, sometimes the ghosts th grow extra, extra lush. Sometimes the ghosts grow sparse. Here's another example of ghosts one year and then the next year. More ghosts. Anomalous substances, strange white powders, um, magnetites, anomalous white sponge-like substance that Janet Osbard's still growing at home in, in um, the Netherlands that are unknown to, previously unknown to science on Earth. Specific spots where the white powders were found. Um, extra ordinary levels of magnetite. Um, other soil and effects, as I said, just when you think you've got a pattern, then another formation goes and changes it. So here's an example on the top of snow that winter that has settled and stayed in the crop formation on the top, and then the others examples where the snow hasn't stayed, it's melted on the site of the crop formation. Atmospheric phenomena, this was a cone that was visible in the clouds on the winter solstice, six months after the formation had appeared. Weird light phenomena. Uh, of course, plenty of UFO sightings, but also uh, sorts of other balls of light. going nuts on me again. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it, stop it, stop it, go back. <laughs> <laughs> so
So we've jumped quite a bit here. There we go. Let's come back again. Yeah, I'm right, thanks. Okay, um, I can't quite remember why I put this in now, except it was a beautiful painting. Uh, certainly there's a relationship with white horses, so, um, just like the Neolithic hill forts and barrows and so on. Um, crop formations seem to be attracted to white horses um, as they're carved in the chalk downs. Now, as well as the light phenomena, there's also time phenomena. This is a photograph, an old-fashioned um, film photograph, in which the outside edges are in the same time, but in the middle of the photograph, it's as if there's a two-second time lapse, and there's photos of people as they are, and then again as they are two seconds later, have appeared on the same print. So people quite often report weird time experiences. They'll be in a formation for what seems like 20 minutes, and they come out, and it's four hours later. Um, OK, I've mentioned pilots. Um, there's certainly one plane that's actually crashed as a result of going over a crop circle formation. And just a little set on some of the ice circles and snow circles that appear in winter. Um, this one in Sweden, some of them are explicable in terms of eddies in the river, but a lot of them have no obvious explanation like that. This one from Sweden, these ones from Schleswig-Holstein, and these snow circles from the Urals. Again, these were all accompanied by UFO sightings. Strange snow circles. Um, Here we go, here's a, a typical kind of case history. These snow circles were discovered on the 6th of November the, by the Russian woman Valentina from a balcony on the 8th floor of a building in the town of Kazan. Right next to the apartment building is a playground where the snow formation was found. At about 10 o'clock, as Valentina was about to go to bed, her two cats started to behave strangely. She felt forced to go out onto the balcony from where she discovered the snow pattern. Um, here's a sand circle from Colombia that appeared spontaneously. Here's another sand circle from New Mexico, that, again accompanied by a UFO sighting. At least one man claimed to have seen a mysterious light in the sky land there and then took off pretty quick. And even tree circles have been spotted in, um, in Holland, in the Netherlands and in Canada too. Um, yeah, you saw that one. Doreen's morning coffee slowly grew chill in her trembling hand. They had returned. Rug circles. And um, <laughs> we're getting sillier. Um, this one is not a spoof, this is a sheep circle, <laughs> which is <laughs> from um, Scotland, northeast Scotland. And this is apparently, it wasn't to do with laying out the food, it just happens that sheep arrange themselves in circles sometimes. This one was 2001 in northeast Scotland. And this is another one from Sky. A sheep circle. Okay, let's scamper on. We're up in 97 now. Barbary Castle and Burderop Dam. Now you'll recognize this as the Tree of Life, the Kabbalist Tree of Life. A lot of debate on this one as to whether it might actually be a, a man made one. Certainly, symbols from human esoteric traditions do start after this one to occur reasonably frequently. Okay, nice one at Stonehenge, 97. And let's just scamp a few through designs. Um, I find this one particularly interesting um, because I work with earth acupuncture. And I would expect the main dragon vein running through that hillside to have been severed and damaged by the cutting of that motorway. And 
what dowsers would do with a severed dragon line like that would be maybe to go up and put a cairn on either side of the cutting on the center of the main dragon line and reconnect it with some visualization exercises and release the trauma from the flow across that, that mountain dragon vein. Here, the crop circle formation appearing just here um, has effectively done the same thing. And the, so this is a dimension of crop circles that I think is going on. There's, it's earth acupuncture on a much bigger scale than your, your typical human human dowser can pull on their own. Uh, but there's definitely an earth healing component working the meridian system of the earth. Um, the Manton Ant, Freddie Silver extended the lines from the legs and found that they referenced, um, I think it was 16 local sacred sites, um, old Neolithic sacred sites in the area around Avery. Okay, on through a few more. Starting to get beautiful series now. We had this one in 97 at Silbury, followed by this one, Milk Hill, and this one at Hackpen Hill. This was in Denmark. This was in Germany. This one was in Germany. Um, and as someone on the FGK website put it, um, I'll give you the English translation, labyrinths in crop. Not enough crop circles are a mystery on their own. The visitor now even has to wonder how to get to the center of the circle. Add a labyrinth to a crop circle. Um, luckily, no problems for the people of Oregon on that score. Okay, this extraordinary one that, um, th was it you and Jeff alluded to this, Hugh? The, um, there's some Mayan calendrical numbering going on in there. And that was a Beltane wheel in uh, 99. Rather, Danebury rings, Danebury rings, Goodworth Clatford, the sanctuary, and on evolving, evolving. Interesting little signature glyphs there. Um, that's Buckinghamshire. There's been a whole little spate, there's a whole area of crop circles, secondary area, around Buck Buckinghamshire, um, Hertfordshire way. And one thing they tend to have in common is pentagonal geometries. Whereas, for example, the Sussex formations tend to have um, triangular geometries. The Kent formation centered around um, um, sorry, the name's gone for a second. The megalithic area in the North Downs around Kent, Kitscoty, and so on. They tend to be he he hexagonal geometries. Um, some kind of representation of a lunar eclipse going on there in 99. Avebury Truslow, an extraordinary one. And this one, which of course looks just like the menorah. The it's a representation of the seven chakras, if you like, with the sevenfold candlestick. And the little thing above it is the traditional ritual item that goes with it, the oil lamp. Okay, a few snakies. 
Chill Bolton Radio Telescope. What happened there? Oh, I see. Yeah, this happened at Chill Bolton Radio Telescope the year before the famous one happened. And on some of these showing signs of being... 15 minutes, yeah. 15 minutes, good. Yeah, on. yeah okay. Um, shout at me again in 10 here. <laughs> Otherwise I'll lose it. Um, yeah, here's an example of one of the Kentish ones. There's a, a Trosley. You'll see recurring themes with the Kent ones of um, triple fold stuff. That's another one at Trosley. And another. Now, there's been a suggestion that that one's a representation of the Saros cycle of lunar orbits. This nice little series here, all from Wiltshire. That one followed by this one, followed by this one. Um, North Yorkshire. Um, that's a sacred Tibetan Antikarana cube. And again, some interesting stuff evolving. That's just by the Devil's Den. Now this was the first piece of heptagonal geometry, sevenfold geometry, which is you don't find sevenfold geometry in nature. You, know, you get that once you start interacting with human consciousness. Um, this one here took crop circle making to a whole new level. Suddenly there was weaves of different layers, different heights within the crop here. Um, unfortunately the farmer cut it down after a day, but you can see the extraordinary detail of the layering and the weavering, different heights of downing. Okay, we're going to scamper on through a few German formations. Things were really happening in Germany in 99. Um, oh yeah, just a little break about the goddess territory around Avebury. Some of you may know this diagram, the three faces of the crone represented, maiden mother and crone, uh, around Silbury and Avebury. And a little look at the Michael line and the Michael and Mary lines here as they wave through Avebury. And the Alton Barn goddess. And it's just below where the umbilical cord from the, the mother goddess's belly up on um, Nap Hill comes down into the land is um, of course East Field where most of the crop circles are happening. And two circles in the Wiltshire landscape. Uh, this is the work of Bert Jansen. So on beyond what um, David Furlong has done in terms of um, identifying two circles in the Wiltshire landscape, Bert Jansen found that if you expanded those circles out more, you got a whole host of sites, um, famous old sacred sites that also connect with crop circles. This is David Furlong's original twin circles. Um, and Bert Jansen's done some very I can really recommend his website, Crop Circles and More, if you like this stuff. Um, if you just see how this builds up, he's created two new circles, got the geometry of the Great Pyramid in it, which of course encodes squaring the circle and has found relationship between 
the Silbury Hill and the Great Pyramid. Um, here's the Mary Line formations on Mary Line going through Silbury Hill. Um, yeah, go and have a look at Bert Jansen's work. For me, he's the most exciting geometer and um, highly intelligent leaps of imagination into seeing how squaring the circle is represented in all sorts of different ways in crop circles. Let's just scamper on quickly up through the end of the year 2000. silly on me. <laughs> um, tetrahedrons and things. I think I'll just scamper through this lot because I've run out of time. Um, I love this one. This was an old barrow that had a nice circle and cross formation and you can see the four squares in the lay of the crop within each of those circles. But even in the center of the formation, there were nettles that had a spiral to them. A little patch of nettles in the middle had been spiraled down. There. Um, and very nice play on integrating the presence of a, an old sacred site into the design of a crop circle. On through to a few more. You can see how the complexities of designs are increasing. It's anyone's guess how many of these are real and how many of these are man-made. Some people think that almost none of them are, man, are, are real nowadays. Personally, I think there's still some really interesting ones going on, but these are probably the majority of them the work of humans, but I don't know that for sure. That was quite an extraordinary one. But if it is the work of humans, that begs the whole discussion of so what. Plainly, the humans are being inspired to do it. Plainly, they're seeing it as some kind of guerrilla geomancy. Plainly, they have an understanding that working a beautiful geometry into a ley line, into a field, is going to have a healing, harmonizing effect. Um, as far as where the inspiration comes from, from the geometers who are designing these, certainly some of them are, are, are claiming telepathic communication with the aliens. Um, this gets us onto the Chill Bolton one, which I won't labor the point of this. You, you're probably all aware of this one. This was a radio telescope. This formation appeared here. And subsequent research, it was repeated again the following year in a different, quite exciting form. A few in Germany from, 19, from 2000. Quite a lot of interesting ones. So things were really getting going in Germany here. This was from Montana. Things are getting quite exciting in America, too. Another one from Montana. Um, this is, I'll just, I think I might finish on this. This is um, a bunch of conclusions from a research project that the British Society of Dowsers, Earth Energies Group, got involved with. These were the conclusions of, um, led by senior physicist and dowser Jim Lyons and a whole bunch of other dowsers, and this was their collective conclusion in 2000. Significant earth energies were present at or near the site before the crop circles were formed. Deep water or energy lines cross at or close to the center of the formation. Blind springs are often found at the center of symmetrical circular patterns. Downshafts or energy vortices mark the focal points of the crop pattern. Shallow veins of water follow the shape of many designs. Many of the shallow water veins appear to have been shaped close to the time of creation of the circle. Many people are affected physically or emotionally either during or following a visit to a circle. The centers of blind springs and down shafts created the most noticeable change. Kinesiology tests confirmed a depletion of muscle strength at key points and lines. 
The direction of lay of the crop also affected most people. Walking in the same direction as the lay of the crop was found to be easier than walking against the lay. The auras of seed heads taken from within the circle are considerably larger than the auras of heads in the surrounding crop. If the outside of the circle is one unit, just inside the formation, two to six units. At the center of the circle, two to eight units. The moisture content of the soil is significantly lower within the circle than outside. Forces other than mankind appear to be involved in the formation of these patterns. So this was a douse up by the group, and they reckoned that 67% had earth-made involvement, in other words, Gaia and earth spirits, elemental realms. 50% of them had input from previous civilizations on this planet, particularly probably um, Bronze Age Neolithic. And other civilizations, in other words, extraterrestrial civilizations, had 58% involvement. So that was an interesting little project the British Society of Dowsers did. Come back, come back. Um, okay, now this is some fascinating work that Freddie Silver did. He went out with his dowsing rods and doused crop formations and found that outside them you could find a series of concentric circles. And so he marked the concentric circles of wave effects outside a crop formation, measured them, and then went back home and looked at the geometry of the circle and discovered that if you, for, for example, expanded, continued the nesting geometry out, the implicit geometry within a circle, if you expanded it on out, you then find, as you get this example here, that the nodes of the expanded geometrical forms coincided exactly to the distance of the concentric circles. So there's a sense in which the dowsing proved the sacred geometry and the geometry proved the dowsing as far as these formations are concerned. Um, he also doused radials of energy and some of these radial lines that you can douse link up with other formations in the region. Some more examples of um, interpolating those nested geometries on out to see where the radial lines actually meet. And you can see a, a precise relationship. And it's interesting that he discovered those on the ground by dowsing first before then working out the geometries. Okay, we'll just scamper on. We've nearly finished this show. I believe that studying these formations, studying these geometries, has an effect on the third eye. I think that's part of the beauty of looking at geometry. And the crop circles, if nothing else, like aesthetically stunning, but I believe that um, they have an impact on human consciousness, just the very act of looking at these slides. Um, this one, Milk Hill, was famous for being so huge, could it possibly have been a real one? Um, my intelligence is that this was actually 10 different hoaxing teams got together one night and did this, but it's, it is so stunningly accurate and you can never be sure with the, with the claims of the humans. Um, because sometimes they claim ones that were Originally that was MI5's game, but then there seemed to be other egos involved. But um, So who knows, but this, is a, this was a stunner. And the corn dolly at the center of the circle that was reported, every single circle had a different shape, a different detailed style to it. And there it is in relation to the white horse. 
The Chilbolton face, you're probably all aware of these now. This seems to have been a reply to the Arecibo message we sent out um, a few years earlier from the Arecibo telescope. The answer came back with a few different details. Um, we said who we are in the message out. The reply came back um, in a way that we could understand, showing a different solar system, showing the formation that was at the previous year, perhaps represents their radio telescope, because we'd sent in ours, sent in our message out, a picture of our radio telescope. Um, and a few details, genetic details, you can see the different shape of a little ET character compared with the human character. Where are they? There. Okay, one minute, one minute. Let's scamper quickly to the end of this set. And it is only fair to tell you that we have now got halfway through my crop circle slideshow and we've been going on far too long. So I suggest that we pick up and do the second half at the Little Green Gathering later on this summer. Will that work for you, Hugh? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll show part two of this then. Owen Airport, Plymouth. Um, ah, Bracken Circle. I live in Bracken country. I was very excited to see a Bracken Circle in Devon in 2001. Uh, okay, I'll just spin to the end of this slideshow. It's coming up very soon. Uh, Norfolk, Cambridgeshire. Uh, nice to see Norfolk's getting crop circles. Um, not unexpected that simple circle, just to use a crude racist joke for a second. Hertfordshire, Bedfordshire, West Sussex, West Sussex. East Sussex, Kent, Rochester, Kent, Netherlands, Netherlands.